Hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining our session today. Uh, we'll get started maybe in a minute or so. In the meantime, I would like you to go through uh, some information uh, just to introduce uh, the company as well as uh, some logistics uh, with respect to the uh, presentations and the webinar. So uh, we are a company of, uh, you know, about uh, 350 plus clients. Uh, we have a multi-city presence, a team of about 45 plus team professionals uh, who are working with RiskPro. And uh, we primarily focus on risk management and regulatory compliance. Uh, and these topics and these areas are of high concern today and very relevant for uh, Indian companies. Uh, so we are essentially rolling out these uh, webinars to educate and uh, you know bring the community up to up to speed with uh, what are the important things that are happening uh, globally as well as uh, nationally uh, on this slide uh, you just have a little bit of logistics information so if uh, anyone is not able to see or hear the session uh, you may try to refresh or uh, uh, connect again uh, you can send in your questions uh, as and when you please. Uh, they will be responded to uh, towards the end of the session. And uh, by nature of this format, everyone is in uh, mute only mode. And we will try to spend about uh, 50 minutes on the session. Uh, so this is um, uh, Manoj Jain. I'm the co-founder director of RiskPro. And uh, we uh, personally, as well as, as an organization, we have done uh, 40 plus uh, engagements on GDPR. So we try to bring in our knowledge from uh, from client projects uh, and share it with the audience. So let's see, I guess uh, we may give uh, uh, another minute or so, or maybe we'll get started, let others join in. Uh, let's go ahead and get started on the, on the session. We're already at 3.5. Okay, so the topic for today is uh, GDPR challenges and pitfalls. Uh, why we specifically chose this topic is, uh, is is that certain areas under GDPR are extremely challenging to understand, to interpret, as well as implement. And then there are some of the other areas which are, uh, although very easy to understand, but uh, they are normally forgotten or uh, are very elusive. So those are the pitfalls, uh, which means uh, people understand them, know about them, but for some reason uh, they don't implement them. Uh, so we'll see that over the next course, uh, we're going to see uh, all of this information to the extent we can in the next one hour and a quick overview about uh, my profile, uh, but it will be available also as a recording. So should you choose to connect, uh, you could do so later. Okay, so uh, we have we essentially at the GDPR anniversary, we are doing uh, six webinars on GDPR. So some of you may have attended uh, the one that was held in the morning. Uh, this is the second one and we plan to have another one uh, later in the afternoon today and then another three tomorrow. So uh, it's important for us to uh, you know, warm up to certain concepts. Uh, otherwise, uh, the whole context will be lost and you wouldn't understand exactly uh, what are the uh, requirements. So, so I would uh, spend maybe uh, two to four minutes or five minutes on uh, specifically these areas, which is uh, uh, the importance of uh, the principles as well as uh, what is lawful basis and the consent and those kind of things to set the context. And then we jump straight into the uh, subject. Uh, I, I just want to also confirm that everyone is able to uh, hear me and see the screen. Uh, if not, uh, you may drop in your uh, chat message and I can see that if you have any issues. Uh, based on what I see, you, you are able to see and hear me, so that's good. Okay, so the first uh, slide that we have, which is very important, is uh, essentially the six principles of uh, GDPR. And let's go over this very quickly uh, to set the context. Uh, on the left, on the right-hand side, you have the, the short uh, nomenclature of the principles. The first one is uh, lawful basis. Uh, GDPR says that we cannot process information unless we have a lawful basis for processing. It is fair and it is transparent uh, to the person's uh, you know, personal data. 
the second principle talks about uh, purpose limitation, uh, which essentially means that uh, the information that we collect, uh, the, the names, the phone numbers, uh, all the personal data, the PII, personal information of the person, uh, whatever we collect uh, has to be collected for a very defined specific purpose and it should be a legitimate purpose it cannot be illegal uh, activity and uh, once we have collected that we cannot use it for any other purposes uh, the third one is uh, data minimization uh, here what we mean is uh, that uh, all the data that we are collecting it should be relevant to our processing and uh, it should be limited to what we are trying to do so we should not be collecting excessive information we should not be sharing this information excessively with a large audience uh, in the organization and, and those kind of things. Uh, fourth one is simpler. It says uh, the data may, should be maintained accurately. And uh, fifth one is, uh, is another difficult one, which is uh, storage limitation, uh, which means that uh, data should be stored only as long as it's required. And uh, <clears throat> data retention policies have to be defined in the company. Uh, sixth one is is the favorite of all which normally mentions that uh, a company should have information security controls and protect the confidentiality availability of the data that's where all of your uh, information security it controls would be so so these are the six principles and you can say the the heart and the foundation of uh, gdpr uh, they may look just six rows of uh, you know uh, information uh, but uh, believe me, uh, most of these uh, fines and all that that we're going to see or we have seen and the breaches that we are going to see and have seen in the past uh, will be centered around uh, several of these. So essentially, these are the setting stones or the foundational stones for the rest of the uh, uh, regulation. Um, moving on to the next one. Uh, so this next slide, I want to tie it back into the first one. So first one, you have uh, the first principle that says uh, data should be processed lawfully. So that first uh, principle breaks down into another six areas and uh, it defines what is lawful basis of processing. Uh, so, so the lawful basis essentially means that you have, if you collect data and you process data, uh, you, you, you have to do it under one of the six uh, options given to you. And uh, those essentially will just quickly go through uh, first one is uh, contractual necessity. That means uh, there is a contract in place. It could be an employer-employee contract. It could be a buyer-seller contract, uh, and, you know, all those things. Uh, if you have a contract, then you can process the information to the extent that the contract allows. Uh, if you have a legal obligation, the next one is, uh, you know, in, in case the, the government or the agencies or legal authorities are, are, are asking you to do something with the data, such as uh, AML checks, KYC checks, um, uh, depositing uh, TDS, uh, any of that information, then those activities are called uh, legal obligations and you are required to do that activity because of law. Uh, uh, the other two are uh, a little less relevant uh, for our information and context, but still there. A vital interest and public interest, which means if it's in the public interest, uh, you can do the activity you're planning to do. Uh, then we have legitimate interest, which means, uh, you know, uh, if you don't have consent and if you don't have any other basis, uh, possibly you can use a legitimate interest, which means that uh, it's in my interest as well as in the interest of uh, the data subject or the user. And, uh, you know, he'll not feel it intrusive and uh, he'll not be affected by, you know, uh, what I'm trying to do significantly. And then you can use that as a basis. And the last one is consent, which means uh, if someone has given you consent, you can uh, process the information. So again, uh, while uh, the six principles are the heart, and this is also the uh, important area, which means uh, the regulation says if you don't have any of these uh, six uh, available to you to do the activity or the processing, then you're not allowed to process the data, which means you can't touch the data, you can't do anything with the data. Uh, so a very classical example is uh, you have an email marketing list and uh, you know you had consent that i can send mails to you now uh, tomorrow uh, somebody you know uh, withdraws the consent uh, the, the consent and he says opt out uh, as soon as it does that now because there is no other basis for you to process and consent has al also been withdrawn uh, that means that now you cannot email to the person and also it means that you cannot save or you know keep that information that you previously had about the the user so you have to minimize the data that you hold you have to essentially start deleting uh, all, some some or most of that information. Uh, so these are the two things that I thought uh, you know I should definitely bring in. Uh, and a, a couple of other quick uh, points. 
uh, one year of GDPR uh, kind of ends today, tomorrow, and uh, lots of uh, complaints, breaches have been reported to uh, authorities uh, in the EU region. Different authorities are acting differently. Some have received a lot, some have received a little less. Uh, and, and then, you know, there are several investigations that are also going on uh, across all these uh, complaints and data breaches that have been submitted. Fines have also been issued. Uh, one of the largest was uh, the 50 uh, million, which is to uh, Google and uh, smaller ones as well and more significant ones also have been uh, kind of issued uh, sanctions for violations uh, you know ranging from uh, reprimands to fine depending upon the sensitivity and the nature of the violation so uh, these uh, sanctions or these violation uh, you know actions they range from okay you know don't do it again to a small fine to a large fine it, it depends on the case of the uh, you know the circumstances of the case uh, and then the fines are essentially calculated on a specified basis, which is the maximum, uh, but otherwise uh, they can always be less than that percentage, 4% or 2%. Uh, the GDPR permits data subjects certain legal courses. So, you know, all those legal courses have not been started to be used by, by individuals. Uh, so this is a one year. I mean, you know, we'll have a lot more uh, to discuss. Uh, there are several sessions that we have and we're covering different areas in those uh, sessions. Uh, so coming on to the uh, challenges, uh, again, as I mentioned, GDPR is complex. So there are a lot of areas to be covered. Uh, what I thought we should cover is probably, you know, some of the more challenging ones or the six areas uh, or five or six areas of concern. And uh, these are listed out uh, here. The first one is territorial scope. Uh, and we'll see some or most of these in more detail. Uh, territorial scope essentially means that who does GDPR apply to? And uh, today, lots of companies in India, uh, many of them uh, have very little idea whether GDPR applies to them or not, or in one con or in which context. Uh, and similarly, uh, you know, some scenarios can be extremely challenging even for the practitioners to identify uh, whether uh, it applies or not. But if you start to, uh, you know, bring the case together, the, all the aspects together, then possibly you would get a fairly good answer to what applies and what doesn't apply. Uh, transparency is another one data retention deletion uh, uh, some more and then the other points so let's kind of explore these points in, in more detail and see why these are challenges for, for people uh, so these are the four fundamental building blocks i'm going to cover the territorial only for now uh, i'm assuming everyone knows what personal data is uh, phone numbers names email addresses date of birth uh, gender uh, biometric and those kind of things Okay, so why is territorial scope a challenge? And uh, you know, first of all, what the law covers. Uh, the, the law says that uh, you know, a, a person, anyone, uh, any organization who is in the EU region uh, has to uh, you know comply with and has to comply with all the aspects of GDPR for all the data that it holds uh, about the person. Uh, so, which essentially means that. Uh, even if the person's uh, data is uh, global or outside of uh, EU, even if he's not a, a EU citizen or a resident, uh, that data is going to be covered. So any organization who is in the EU, uh, uh, any activity they do with personal data, all of the data has to be covered under GDPR and all their activities are have to be GDPR compliant. For, for companies who are outside the EU, uh, essentially, they will be covered in the net only if uh, they are selling or profiling to uh, EU residents. Uh, and the data subjects in EU would essentially mean not just the citizens, but as well as, uh, you know, holiday makers, uh, travelers, uh, other residents, uh, other citizens living in Europe. Uh, only that data has to be covered. So uh, to, to put it differently, an Indian company, uh, if it's doing business with EU as well as with India, uh, it has to protect uh, or uh, the GDPR compliance applies only to the data set, which is uh, for the European uh, residents. Uh, it doesn't necessarily cover the, uh, the, the data set of Indians uh, or the Indian people uh, interacting with that organization. So this is at a high level what the requirement is. And of course, there are granular uh, aspects uh, to that. Uh, uh, and we saw in the previous slide, it also talks about monitoring. So what exactly is uh, monitoring? Monitoring could be that uh, if you're tracking somebody on the internet, their behavior, uh, you're doing remarketing, retargeting marketing, uh, which means uh, you know you have ads showing up to people and they have been followed from site to site. Uh, you have cookies that are tracking people. 
so any of those activities even if you do a monitoring behavior you're not necessarily selling to those people or doing business but even if you're monitoring then that is also covered so those entities who are monitoring would be covered uh, so all the all these uh, analytics companies, uh, uh, you know, Google, AdWords, uh, Analytics, Amazon, uh, all these people are uh, engaging in these behaviors, so they would be uh, kind of uh, covered in in that process. So here, uh, just like a like a little example uh, that I had, uh, which essentially means or says that uh, you know there is a company, and uh, then we have uh, two websites uh, of that company. So there is one EU company that has two websites. Uh, one is uh, targeting US uh, only uh, employee, uh, US only users, and the other one is targeting uh, UK uh, only uh, users. Uh, the question is which website users will get protection under GDPR? Uh, so while I cannot receive the responses uh, from you essentially, uh, I would have the answer on the next slide, but just give it a thought. Uh, which website users uh, do you think will get protection under the GDPR? Uh, so that's the scenario. It's a simple scenario, and it also kind of elaborates and explains uh, what the uh, you know the, the territorial scope talks about. Okay, the answer is uh, is is both. So why it is both is because uh, uh, it's an EU company. So as as we discussed in the territorial scope. Uh, and any EU company uh, has to comply with uh, all the users uh, across the globe, whether it is having a US business or a European business, uh, US uh, you know, users or European, all the people have to be compliant to that. So, so that's why uh, for this specific example, uh, both, the entity, uh, both the websites have to be covered under, uh, under GDPR. Okay, so here we have a, a, a very good uh, example or a case study about uh, again transparency and lawful basis so we have seen uh, if i go back a couple of slides uh, we had seen that uh, you know there are six uh, ways of lawful basis of processing uh, so here we have an example uh, which is an actual fine uh, in this case what happened is uh, true vision production is is a, is a television company and uh, we'll call it tvp so tvp placed uh, fixed cctv style cameras with mics in three clinic rooms in the maternity assessment unit. So there's a hospital, there's a maternity unit, uh, and uh, it had certain clinics. Uh, TVP had taken permission from the hospital for the purpose of, uh, uh, it's not filing, it's filming, for the purpose of filming patients at the clinic for documentary on stillbirth. So what TVP wanted to do was, uh, it wanted to create a documentary on uh, why stillbirths happen, what are stillbirths, or, or whatever it may be. Uh, it had taken due permission from the hospital. Uh, TVP was of the view that such a filming would be in the public interest. Uh, so essentially it was trying to use public interest uh, as a lawful basis of processing, which means that uh, because you know it's, it's talking about stillbirth, I'm sure many people are aware, or many people would want to know about this, uh, and it's in the interest of uh, the whole nation as a whole. Uh, it was trying to use that as a lawful basis. Uh, and then, of course, the other fact is CCTV by nature captures uh, sensitive information and traumatic data because stillbirths are essentially when the, the, the birth is, you know, uh, of a still uh, stillborn baby. Uh, TVP did not directly and specifically inform patients attending the clinic that they would be filmed. And uh, instead, indirectly, they were telling people that, okay, you'll be filmed by, they were putting a small notices on the walls in the waiting room or near the camera. Uh, but they, they didn't really, you know, ask individually each person or each patient that, you know, I'm going to be filming you or you're going to be, you know, filmed because of this uh, requirement. Uh, so ICO, which is the UK authority, had taken the view that uh, stillbirth and the related documentary film would not fall under public interest for lawful basis. So if you don't have public interest as a lawful basis, you don't have a contractual obligation, you don't have legal, legitimate interest, vital, uh, the only one remaining is consent. And because you didn't take consent properly, uh, you didn't have any lawful basis, which means the filming of uh, that, uh, the patients uh, within that clinic uh, was illegal and it was unlawful. Uh, and that's why the fine of 120,000 came about. So here the, the, the point that we're trying to drive at is, uh, you may feel that you're doing something good for the nation and uh, you try to use that as a lawful basis. Uh, but to bring it into context with all the other information, the fact that, uh, you know, sensitive data has been collected, sensitive uh, data requires explicit permission. It's not just, uh, uh, sorry, explicit consent. 
it's not just taking consent and you know putting it on a website or anything that uh, we are going to do this or do you agree that this is there explicit means uh, you have to state the purpose of it and you have to specifically ask for consent on that uh, on that particular line item uh, and then so that definitely failed and the other fact was uh, that it was indirectly trying to uh, get this information so i think uh, tvp knew that it wanted consent as a lawful basis uh, but it didn't take that because uh, it knew that uh, if it, it were to ask people specifically, uh, it may not get that consent. So indirectly, it was putting uh, pamphlets on the on the tables, on the walls, uh, hoping that people will read. And then uh, it was trying to uh, use that as a basis to demonstrate to regulators that, uh, hey, I, I've taken consent because it's on the wall and on, on the paper, on, on the tables and all. Uh, so this is an example of a, of a lawful basis wrongly selected and uh, trying to be not transparent uh, in, in doing business. Uh, coming into the next one. Uh, so next one is, is a point about data retention and deletion. So uh, another challenge here is uh, lots of companies are having an issue about defining data retention. So how long can I keep my data? Uh, data that is sitting in my databases on Azure Cloud, Amazon, web services it's sitting in NAS servers emails uh, there is no clarity within companies and uh, most of the companies uh, would like to keep the data forever whether it's marketing list whether it is uh, emails uh, campaigns whether it is you know user data uh, all these data they would like to keep it uh, you know endlessly uh, but uh, the regulation requires that data should be defined uh, in terms of retention and uh, also uh, deletion processes uh, need to be identified and, and defined uh, so we need to identify all the data across the company. Uh, they need to be classified in terms of uh, bucketing. So their bucketing could be sensitive data, non-sensitive data. It, it could be the fact that uh, this data is one year old, this data is four years old uh, by duration, uh, by the person responsible. So uh, once we define all the uh, categories, then we are able to identify deletion rules uh, of that information and uh, all the special cases uh, you know would be the rights to be forgotten uh, so there are specific requirements for people to request for data deletion uh, and in those scenarios uh, we need to identify exactly where the data is uh, and then the last point is uh, actual deletion should happen not just soft delete so there are companies who are deleting uh, you know maybe just on the screens of applications that the user has been deleted uh, but in the back end in the database, uh, the user still remains active. I mean, the user still is, is is there in the database. So that is not considered deletion. Deletion has to be absolute. That the user's information has to go across or out from all the databases and all the backups uh, that are there. So uh, another point in uh, retention and deletion is, is the fact that uh, have we considered all the data? So you have a uh, structured data which could be in uh, in databases, in applications, Excel files. Uh, then you have data which is sitting in unstructured as unstructured data. Uh, they could be uh, hard copy, uh, you know, documents. They could be uh, files. Uh, they could be your emails uh, which are unstructured uh, and all that. So all these data have to be identified and uh, deletion. Or, uh, policies are slightly more difficult for unstructured data because either we don't know uh, exactly what we have and how much we have or the fact that they are so embedded into the business process that sometimes it becomes uh, difficult uh, to delete that information. Uh, so these are some of the challenges and uh, companies are defining different ways of handling uh, data deletion as well as uh, retention. Uh, even though the same scenario might apply to company A and B, uh, both companies are going to uh, apply different mechanisms uh, for this uh, deletion. So I kind of had a, let me see, uh, I also want to uh, explain uh, deletion with a, with an example or a, or a context. Uh, so let me also pull up my Excel file that I had, which is uh, essentially talking a little bit about deletion, but I also want to cover uh, uh, data minimization part. Uh, so here we have uh, essentially uh, an Excel file, uh, which is an employee master. So it, it's an employee master in the HR department. Uh, and uh, here we have all the fields. So you have your uh, employee code, uh, name, gender, date of birth, uh, all these different things. 
uh, and typically uh, all your most of the companies would have some or more or most of these uh, fields which could be your uh, you know uh, father's name mother's name spouse uh, and and things like that so so let's look at first of all uh, without uh, you know worrying about these two fields uh, let's look at the uh, data in absolute terms uh, as it is so first of all uh, what is personal data within this thing uh, so so let's look at that let's look at uh, what is personal data and what is not personal data uh, personal data would be all these things which can identify a person uh, it, it's an identifier which helps uh, anyone to identify either in isolation or in combination so it could be uh, row number three plus row number five which identifies a person or it could be three plus uh, eight or it could be eight on its own because a bank account typically is uh, is an absolute uh, identifier so all these data points are personal data and uh, what is not personal uh, would be something that is not directly or too relevant uh, for that uh, particular uh, user so it could be for example qualifications institute uh, date of joining date of uh, exit time in the company reporting manager and all although some of these information also can be identified if it's uh, combined uh, with other data points but i would say it is slightly less personal data uh, versus uh, everything else that is there uh, then we have something called sensitive data and uh, within this whole sheet there are lots of sensitive data that has been collected uh, so let's just look at only those items uh, the gender blood group and uh, nationality uh, these are considered sensitive data which means uh, these fall into a higher uh, bracket in terms of uh, importance in terms of privacy and uh, we need to take uh, more specific permissions uh, for these uh, information uh, so, so these are the things and then now uh, looking at uh, another element which is uh, does it meet your uh, GDPR requirement so here we would go kind of uh, one by one and look at it but uh, assuming you are in a contractual obligation where the employee is going to join you and you are an employer you need most of this information in order to process salaries in order to process uh, information of employment uh, background verifications and all that uh, but typically what you will never need or what you will mostly not need uh, are some of those things uh, that we can look at uh, and these would be uh, things like blood group nationality uh, father's name mother's name uh, spouse so date of birth date of marriage date of children now we may say that okay nationality is is required for employment i would want to know where the person is coming from uh, so if you have a very specific and defined requirement uh, then this can also meet uh, gdp requirement and it can be a yes uh, but it could also be uh, no for any any particular uh, em em employer uh, where nationality is not so much of a relevance uh, so it depends on case to case but generally uh, some of these things uh, are generally not uh, necessary a blood group uh, is, is uh, some of the view or the taken by the ico or, or most regulators is that blood group is is something that is excessive and it is not uh, necessary for for employment Similarly, uh, you may take the view that father's name, mother's name, maybe it is required, maybe not required. Uh, date of birth, spouse, date of birth, why would you want it? Maybe you want to wish them uh, date of marriage and children. Uh, in, in all these scenarios where it's a no or a maybe, uh, it's best to take specific consent uh, of that user that I'm going to collect your uh, date of birth, your, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to collect your spouse, date of birth, your date of marriage because I would like to wish you on those occasions or I would like to know your children so I can invite you on events and things like that. Uh, unless you have those uh, specific consent, uh, employment by its own will not allow you or will not permit you to take that uh, information about uh, this unless you have a very strong reasoning uh, for collecting this information. So here we have seen uh, this company is collecting uh, a lot of excessive information that is the data minimization principle violation and uh, it doesn't meet GDP requirements. So uh, this activity would fail the collection of these four, five six elements will fail and there would be a regulatory penalty uh, had it been an organization in the EU. Uh, and then the lastly uh, coming to data uh, deletion aspect uh, again which I want to cover deletion uh, is about uh, you know what to do or when to do deletion so uh, data retention data deletion applies uh, and there's another principle in GDPR that says that in storage you can only store or you know save information to the extent or to the point that it required for processing so once a person uh, leaves your employment uh, you are not going to need certain uh, data points 
uh, and some of these can be here now this could be yes or no but let's assume that you know most of these are not relevant uh, when and when an employee leaves your company uh, he's not going to uh, you won't need as an employer his gender his date of birth his blood group his nationality you don't need his bank account number now because no more salaries you don't need his pan number you don't need his emergency contacts father mother spouse spouse date of marriage and children so what gdpr says is that uh, once a person leaves your employment all these data points have to be deleted so you don't need to delete the whole record of the employee but you need to delete these fields uh, of an exited user uh, and that is what we mean by data deletion and that's why it's a challenge uh, because there is no right or wrong answer uh, and an employer may say okay i need all this information maybe i have to remit uh, some uh, expenses or some refund or uh, i need his bank account number okay so you may need his bank account for the first 6 months for the first 1 year but why will you need his bank account 10 years after he's left your employment uh, so those are the challenges and those are the questions uh, that companies are facing that what to delete when to delete and and how much of it to delete uh, and gdpr is, is silent on all those uh, questions the only thing it says is that if you don't need certain data for processing then you should not have it and you should define a deletion and retention policies around that uh, so so that is uh, kind of the point on on data deletion coming into uh, another element which is uh, talking about uh, marketing direct marketing so direct marketing is another uh, big challenge for for companies because uh they are not able to you know handle what is opt in what is opt out uh, can i send emails to an old list uh, what do i do with the old list i don't have consent can i contact them or not uh, so there are lots of uh, you know concerns and uh, some of them are valid concerns some of them there is real no answer to it uh, but essentially at the core of it uh, you need permissions you need uh, you know you need to give the individuals their right uh, the data access so that they can change their preferences and you need to have a focused approach to the data that means what exactly do you want to uh, cover and why you are collecting the information so permissions could mean uh, you, you should allow them uh, you know to manage their opt ins you should ensure that only users who have opted into your business uh, are are receiving those mails and uh, you cannot add people yourself to the mailing list uh, you need a first opt in which means people should actually interact with your business uh, in other ways and they should say yes i am open to receiving direct marketing mails uh, otherwise you generally cannot approach them uh, second point is you have to give access to them that means they should be able to change their preferences they should be able to withdraw consent and uh, you should always include uh, unsubscribe uh, in, the, in the footer of most mails or all mails and uh, in, internally you should justify why you want the information and uh, if you are using legitimate interest as a basis that means you are not using consent but you are using li then you should uh, you know uh, uh, complete that li assessment uh, form uh, so so that's uh, kind of more on on the marketing aspect of uh, of you know doing business and gdpr so here uh, we see uh, and let me just bring this also up uh, generally uh, it, businesses will benefit from using legitimate interest uh, as the basis uh, because that is a lawful basis where consent doesn't apply and uh, you know if 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 li has been demonstrated uh, then you can use li even without consent and you can reach out to all your tar target audiences so in direct marketing it normally helps and most companies are doing that they are using legitimate interest as a basis because consent is uh, very difficult and dangerous uh, you know consent if it's not there and an email goes out that's in violation to uh, gdpr whereas li there is no concept of consent is it's an internal uh, uh, assessment that is made saying that i want to do this uh, I, i i know it is not a problem for the user and the user will benefit from it and, and likewise uh, user is is also of the view that yes if i receive this uh, it will be helpful for me hel helpful to me uh so that is the legitimate interest in in, in a small nutshell uh direct marketing on the basis of uh, li is the best way to proceed in, in most circumstances uh, where direct marketing has to be carried out uh you have to target a small and specific audience you can't uh, do carpet bombing uh, of all the users and because once you do that uh, you are no longer specific uh yeah uh and and then uh, the other thing is you you need to reach out to them when the offer with the offering that is precise and closely matching their background so you have identified a small audience but then you can't be so for example uh, you know i'm maybe part of the hospital and i'm reaching out to certain doctors and uh, informing them about an event or or a conference in the hospital 
now i have identified that doctors are my target audience but then to those doctors i cannot send some random email saying that okay you know uh, we have a travel vacation or we have a trip uh, here and there uh, which is unrelated to what he is wanting uh, so so that is uh, another thing that to be taken care of and then uh, you know you have to offer the right to object uh, to that ally so let's look at examples uh, of when ally can help direct marketing uh, so a recruiter contacting a candidate for a job uh this is li uh, example which means uh, you will never actually give a consent to a recruiter because a recruiter is contacting you thinking that uh, you will benefit and uh, and and he will also benefit he'll get commission you will get a job uh, so that is essentially like how li works uh but uh, that same recruiter if he is specializing in a very specific area like for example maybe he is hiring only scientists uh, for, for the government of india and and that is only thing that he does then if that recruiter is contacting somebody for uh, for a random job like you know email marketing or for a uh, for a processor role operations role which is unrelated to his uh, 100% core business then that will be considered un unlawful and it will be in violation of gdpr which means that you know the recruiter who is uh, hiring a scientist can never be calling and reaching out to people who are not scientists uh, so so that's what you know the first point is another example is a, a research company contacting an expert in in a subject and carrying out a telephone based research on that specific uh, on that specific subject so uh, market research companies can reach out to experts can reach out to general consumers and and roll out a survey uh, only if they are targeting very specifically the the skill set they need the type of person and it's not inclusive uh, inviting ex employees your alumni to a function or to your company even after years that they have left so in those cases even when you reach out to the uh, ex employees you don't need consent because it's it's in the legitimate interest of both uh, the both the parties uh, to be part of that function uh, selling an enterprise application for payroll to the head of hr in a non intrusive manner so this is all these examples are you know something that can be a, a case for a legitimate interest and you don't need specific consent from the users or, or from the people who are uh, sharing their information or whose information is been processed uh the other challenge we had in my previous slide was uh, was third parties now third parties uh, come in various forms uh, these third parties could be your customers vendors uh, contractors investors shareholders auditors uh, you know regulators data center companies experts so, so there are various types of uh, third parties that a company or a, a corporate engages with uh, and the and then one of the examples i had maybe it's in the wrong place as a slide uh, but let me kind of finish this off also and then continue uh, one of the classic examples of a third party breach was the target data breach where a third party which was a, a air conditioning company uh, it was having access to the target uh, which is a retailer in the us uh, they had access to the data and the data was compromised uh, and there was a 40 million credit card information stolen so the point here is uh, third parties bring in uh, extreme uh, risk to their companies and uh, they generally have uh, security measures which are weaker than uh, most of the corporates uh, they gen they generally one notch lower in terms of security specifically if you're dealing with smaller companies so the, the reason why uh, you know we need to find these weak links is is because uh, you know if you don't identify who are your third parties who are your weak spots uh, all the data breaches that will happen are going to affect you uh, directly or indirectly in both in terms of reputation as well as in terms of uh, gdpr so we are required to build an inventory of third party lists that means you have to list out who are the third parties who are having access to the personal data that i'm using uh, and, and then you have to regularly monitor these people uh, you know in terms of the online activities offline activities uh, and in terms of support it it's very easy for some department to subscribe to an online analytics uh, or a hosting or email marketing uh, service uh, we have to make sure that we know them so uh, if you have a company which has 1000 2000 employees uh, some person in some department will uh, open up an online account for a trial it it might open up say analytics uh, account it might open up a, a dropbox or a google drive uh, accounts randomly and start saving company information so when you do that uh, google drive dropbox uh, mailchimp uh, all these email marketing companies uh, all these services become third parties and are required to have a, a have a dpa uh, in place a, a data protection addendum uh, that we call it so 
under GDPR, no company can share data with a third party unless there is a contract uh, between them. So when an employee is randomly in the organization uh, creating these services, uh, subscribing to the services, creating accounts and, and starting to process information, all those activities need to be captured uh, under GDPR as a data inventory. If you don't do that, then that segment is exposed. And that's why this is a big challenge is because the more employees you have, the more freedom they have to create uh, such services and such uh, you know online accounts uh, that makes it all the more difficult to re really track uh, those issues so here we have uh, you know uh, uh, if uh, only if a gdpr enforceable data protection agreement is in place should we share data uh, the requirement is that data cannot be shared unless a contract is in place and uh, because if a vendors cause a data breach, we are held responsible if a DPA is not in place. So if a DPA is, is not in place and anything goes wrong with that third party, then all the liabilities and uh, you know, responsibilities would come back on the company. And, and that's why third parties is another area of, uh, of big challenge uh, for companies. I'm also checking the questions as, as they're coming just to make sure there's no one having problems with their uh, uh, in the session. Uh, the last one is audit trail. So we need to maintain audit trails as and when we go along. Okay, so coming to a few pitfalls, uh, I'm also aware of the time. We have about 15 odd minutes, 15, 18 minutes. So let's uh, look at some of those pitfalls as well. Uh, some of the, you know, two or three pitfalls that I quickly picked up. Uh, of course, we have more are some of the important ones are these two. Uh, one of the requirements in GDPR is uh, privacy notice uh, should be sent <coughs> to all the users whose data has not been collected from them directly. So what this means uh, is that, uh, for example, when you sign up for Facebook or uh, Twitter accounts, uh, you are giving those organizations your name, your, your phone numbers, your passwords, email address, maybe your address uh, also. Uh, but you don't, give him, uh, you don't give them anything more uh, initially. Now, if Facebook or Twitter go uh, across different uh, services or are publicly able to access some of the information and they collect 10 more things about you, <clears throat> then the law says that uh, you need to get those uh, details. Excuse me. <clears throat> the, the, the law says that uh, <clears throat> you need to notify all those people about where you got their information and what is the purpose of that processing. The second one is talking about uh, <clears throat> GDPR is all about information security, uh, secure our systems and all, and we are all good. So that is a myth or a misconception that uh, GDPR is all about data security. Uh, <clears throat> it really is not, excuse me. Okay, <clears throat> dry throat. Let me see if I can continue. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so the, these two, the reason I've taken these two are because, again, uh, these are very, very difficult to implement. Uh, you normally can easily put a privacy policy on the website and say, okay, this is what you gave me, this is what I'm going to do, and this is how I process. But throughout the business, you're going to process, you're going to collect a lot more information and uh, you might collect it from LinkedIn. You might collect from other sources. You keep building more profile uh, information about the user. Uh, GDPR gives you 30 days of collection of that information to notify the users. They, hey, you gave me two information, but I got eight more from uh, these sources and this is what I'm doing with it. And I'm sure a lot many companies uh, would not do this or don't even know they have to do something like this. Uh, and the second one, of course, uh, GDPR is a lot more than information security. In fact, uh, I would say GDPR is 70% more than just having security controls in place. Uh, <clears throat> believing GDPR only applies to companies based in EU, we have seen that territorial aspect of it. Uh, failing to understand what personal data you ha are storing and processing. Uh, this is uh, again a very, very common pitfall and very important point. Uh, today, data sets are increasing all over. Uh, you have uh, thousands and hundreds of servers, you have different cloud, uh, different online services, SMTP service, SMS services, uh, drives, uh, you know, all those SM, uh, SFTP folders, you have backups, cloud, Excel, NAS, all over. And then uh, the same data set has been replicated also many times more. 
uh, uh, the same copy goes you know in excel specifically you have 10 employees holding that same data in excel um, then we have businesses uh, who are having websites web pages and old vendors with whom we have done business so uh, imagine uh, you have done business with an uh, email marketing company in the past uh, and he has all the information now you stop doing business with that person but do you ever collect uh, and, and ask that data to be discarded uh, even before the gdpr came in or after you would have many companies who do business and then forget to uh, get the data back so what happens if that uh, vendor breaches that data you're responsible because on a specific day you gave him the data you forgot to take it back or he forgot to delete it and, and then it's been misused so the data is, is all over and uh, a strong data inventory helps us to identify where the data is stored so that we are able to uh, manage it uh, <clears throat> Companies can use data for reasons other than stated when it is collected. This is another classical example of uh, cross-selling or using data for multiple purposes. And uh, Google has been fined uh, for for this uh, particular item is, is that uh, it was not specifically taking uh, a very transparently consent for each of the items that it wanted to do. So uh, it, it was an, uh, it was ambiguous, uh, you know, and it was vague in terms of uh, consent. Uh, it just says that uh, you give us this data, we're going to do this, this, this and all. But it didn't it wasn't very specific. So it was trying to use uh, one consent or one uh, specific uh, lawful basis and then trying to use it for another activity uh, that it had. <clears throat> consent that is not collected properly is another very big challenge and data is stored forever. So we love data and we hate to delete that. That's another uh, pitfall. <clears throat> Looking into some examples of what uh, you know consent problems can be. So here I have one or two examples. Uh, you've seen a lot of uh, websites offer uh, white paper downloads. So it will always have something like this. It's a gated content, which means you have to put your email address and you click this button and you get access. So good, you, you get access to the report, but it doesn't give the company the right to use this email address and send you anything else in the future even if it is a similar report even if it is uh, the same subject you are wanting to know about because uh, when you took this and you didn't give any specific consent the primary reason for you to share your email address was that i want this report and when you get that report the job is done so uh, as per storage limitation minimization principle uh, that email should have been deleted as soon as the report went out because uh, you're not allowed to keep it. You didn't take consent. You don't have any other lawful basis. You might use a legitimate interest as a lawful basis, but if you can't use that, then you have no right to even save that email address as soon as the report goes out. So this is one uh, very big challenge or a classical example of a pitfall. Uh, <clears throat> the second example uh, is that, uh, you know, you have uh, forms, people say, okay, download this report. And uh, if you look at this piece here, uh, by clicking download, you agree that we may contact you for the future marketing. So this is also not allowed. Uh, you cannot bundle consent with the performance of contract. Uh, so what you're trying to do is you're trying to give him a, a report, but you can't bind it saying that, okay, only if you give me consent to do marketing, can you get this report? You have to unbundle both of them and you have to give him an optional item. Okay, I want to download, yes and uh, i put a checkbox yes that you can uh, you know uh, approach me for uh, email marketing or, or direct marketing so if you take a bundled consent uh, that is illegal under uh, under gdpr and uh, all the regulators have 50 60 80 pages of uh, published material just on what is a valid consent uh, and that is the, the that is the nature or the severity of this uh, problem uh, how to take explicit consent how to take unbundled consent consent for everything we do a clear consent, a consent that is legible, clear. It's not hidden in lots of pages uh, and, and things like that. Another confusion is uh, what is a who is a controller, who is a processor. So this confusion can uh, aggravate because unless you know uh, what role you have, you can't comply with the regulation. A processor has to do maybe 20, 30 percent of the regulation of GDPR. A controller has to do 100 percent. So in some processing activities, you could be a controller. In some of them, you could be a processor. Uh, one example I can take is uh, when uh, when a, a company, say for example, TCS or Wipro, uh, are, are hiring a recruitment firm that, okay, go out and recruit for me these kind of uh, profiles. Is the recruiter playing the role of a processor or a controller? It, it could be a processor. Uh, if TCS says that go out and uh, it does and picks out and gives all the data only to TCS and does not use it ever for anything else. It could be a controller that recruitment firm can be a controller 
if it is uh, picking up the profiles but also using it for non uh, client it could be using for client b client c client d it may use save it for the next 10 years uh, in that case it could be a controller it can be a joint controller also so if you don't know your role uh, you're going to get the law all wrong okay i'm quickly going to list out uh, these two three points uh, maybe you can just read the grayed out items I think we have covered uh, most of these. Uh, so we have a lot of problems with the BYOD programs, a lot of cloud technologies. So all these are problems, uh, and these are all called shadow systems. There are many more across. Uh, you try to encrypt anything. Okay, I've encrypted. Now I'm all done. Uh, as I told you, uh, information security is just one piece of uh, GDPR. Uh, transparency, consent, all these things are not security controls. So just putting encryption doesn't mean that you know you are GDPR compliant. That's another uh, pitfall or a misconception. And uh, skill sets. So skill sets are also important. Uh, specifically, the example I took about if you if you remember about the the filming of uh, the clinic and things like that. Now that scenario, if it had been uh, put up without the ICO's uh, sanction or the uh, or, or the penalty. Uh, it would be very difficult for any common man to even understand that it could be a non-compliance. Uh, so that is the the, the in-depth uh, requirement or expectation or understanding that it's required in, in order to understand uh, the, the regulation. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly another two one of my one minute uh, explain our services uh, just so that you know what we do. As I mentioned. Uh, we have uh, done about 40 plus projects and uh, we offer different, uh, you know, uh, part time, full time consulting, training services in, in GDPR. Uh, we also uh, are now actively uh, getting into retainership model, which means uh, every two or three days per quarter we spend, we associate with a company uh, and then we help them out offline remote support by emails, by studying the situations, telling them, OK, this is the result or this is the conclusion. Uh, we can do uh, one-off trainings, uh, one-hour, two-hour trainings, web-based in the office. So, so this uh, retainership model enables small companies uh, to implement or maintain their programs, uh, and it doesn't cost them a lot. Like two or three days a quarter is is, is almost nothing, but it helps them to be uh, be on track. Uh, so that's all I have for today, and I'm glad I finished uh, on time. I have five minutes or seven minutes. Uh, so do send across your questions. Uh, I think there are there are some that have come through. And I'm going to try to go through them uh, one by one. And then if there anything remains, we will take it up later on after that. Uh, or I'll send it, sorry, I'm going to send it across over email. So the first question, yeah, we will uh, send out the soft copies to the people who have requested. Uh, the video has also been recorded. It's available uh, online. And the link will come to you as soon, uh, within a day, uh, so that you know you can uh, reuse that information or you can access this material as well as the video so so one of the questions uh, that has uh, come in uh, is internal auditor of parent company which is situated uh, outside eu uh, wants to conduct payroll audit if subsidiary is in eu can the subsidiary share payroll data and uh, personal data with the internal auditor so so the point is uh, internal auditor of parent company uh, so the parent company is outside and the internal auditor is i'm guessing uh, in india or anywhere else uh, if the subsidiary is here so essentially you know th there is also data sharing that is happening between company a to company b uh, and the, that even if it's a parent subsidiary relationship uh, that sharing is not allowed unless uh, there is also a DPA or a contractual uh, arrangement between the organizations also. So every intercompany also has to have uh, those specific uh, uh, data protection agreements in place uh, so that you know the, the activities can be carried out. So in the in this specific uh, question that has been asked, uh, yes, information can be shared as long as uh, this is available. So the the, the next question is. Uh, what do, what do we mean by uh, storage limitation and uh, can there be more examples on this so in in case of uh, storage limitation uh, as i mentioned it's all about identifying uh, when is the point that uh, you no longer need the information uh, let, let's take another example of uh, of a direct marketing list that we have so we are we have an email campaign running we have collected 10 20000 emails and now we are going to uh, use the information <clears throat> 
so certain of the information we never reach out so there are some emails uh, who could be maybe you know based in brazil or based in anywhere else or they are not the type of uh, uh, job title that we want and we never reach out to them and we have not been in touch now five years have passed by uh, and uh, we still have not contacted you know those uh, specific skill set uh, those, those specific data set so what gdpr says is that uh, you know if, if you don't have a requirement you're not used it you're not likely to use it uh, then that data has to be deleted uh, and, and that is you know an example of a storage limitation uh, which means that uh, maybe you know a company may define that two years or three years dormancy can mean the limit by which i have to discard or delete the information uh, so which means any active uh, person on the marketing list i will keep forever uh, but anyone who is not being contacted or is dormant for two years or three years after two or three years I'm going to delete so that is called a data uh, retention policy you define a cutoff uh, for that Another example can be on uh, on your uh, websites that we have e-commerce websites your flip cards Amazon and all that uh, uh, or, or or any uh, you know random services that you sign up for free trial uh, The person gets signed up uh, then never returns to the site ever again so those companies also need to define a retention policy uh, that any user who signed up and he last signed up uh, maybe two years ago and he's not likely to sign up again So internally you have to take a cutoff. Is it one year two years five years? Shall we wait for somebody to for five years to come back or not? And then once you define that yeah, this five years is the cutoff and we, we can't expect users or if they come back Let them re-register then after five years data should be uh, discarded. So, so that is uh, another example of uh, storage limitation Okay, so if, if there's any other question I can uh, take it up otherwise, uh, you know, do send across information and uh, Let's be in touch. Uh, there are more sessions. Uh, the next one that we have is on uh, fines and penalties uh, Then we'll have maybe a repeat uh, training tomorrow as well as the Indian regulation that uh, is gonna kick in hopefully and uh, With the new government also continuing to be the same uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, you know something will come in fairly soon and uh, it should be uh, exciting in terms of what the regulation will have and uh, protection of information of individuals. Thank you very much. Thanks for your patience. Bye.